You see that Haman wants to destroy God's people. And the same history is repeated here. But because of the obstinacy or the faithfulness of the priesthood to not allow this king into the temple, he goes back angry and takes revenge upon God's people and destroys those who are living in his own country. And if there's not a lesson in both of those stories to get out of Babylon, to get out of Egypt. I mean, there is, what else, what other persuasion would we need? You know, we really need to be getting out of Babylon and out of Egypt, and there's many analogies that you could, um, you could talk about that. And I won't make the press to because everybody complains about the issue of where we're living and how we're living and our lifestyles. But there's much to learn just in that idea. The people who got killed, the Jews who got killed, were the ones who were in Egypt, not the ones who were in Israel. So you should know where you should be living. And besides that, everybody knows, I hope, in the time of Esther, okay, when the Jews were there in, in uh, Persia, it was against God's, God's idea, God's plan. He didn't want his people there. He had a number of opportunities to go out, and they don't want to leave. And the reason they don't want to leave is the same reason Lot and his wife don't want to leave Sodom, is because they've got a good lifestyle. Everything's going smoothly, and they don't want to leave. And the same problem happens, and fortunately in the time of Esther, they all get saved. But in this time period, they don't. Read to verse 13. <coughs> We're now into the fifth Syrian war. The fifth Syrian war. <clears throat> we still have the same king of the north, number six, Antiochus III, but the king of the south has changed. We're on king number five, and we're in Ptolemy the fifth. And now, the subject matter for this verse is the king of the north regains control of Palestine. And this happens, oh sorry, the date for this is 202 BC. That's when the fifth Syrian war begins. And he acts, the, the war begins in 202, but the regaining of this happens in the year 200. Okay? So you can see these verses are all having this interplay between who's controlling God's people. God's people are always in subjection. If you do any studies in this further, you will find that the word Palestine isn't used in your reference sources. Today, in all our studies, I just use the word Israel, but the correct term for it is called Coal Syria. That's actually the correct term, and it includes portions of Gaza, portions of southern Syria, and Israel. It covers all that area of um, Jordan, Israel, south of Israel, up to the borders of Egypt. It's called Coal Syria. That's kind of the official term. For, for that area. So everywhere where, I, where I've used Israel, that's really the, the, the proper term, but I, to keep it simple, so we can understand what's going on, I've used the word Israel or Palestine. Syria, was, was that the proper term that same word? No, even today. It's not, you won't find the map whole Syria, but if you do any research, you'll see that that term is easily understandable and identifiable. So the date is 2013? The war, the war oh, it's reverse 13. <coughs> In verse 13, the year is 202, the beginning of the Fifth Syrian War, begins in 202, and by 200, the King of the North has regained, regained control of Palestine. So let's read verse 13. It says, For the King of the North shall return, and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. I will say, even if you were using the King James and you went through these verses, by the time you come to verse 13, 
Okay, even if you had made a mistake in verse 10, you could backtrack from verse 13 backwards and you could figure out that uh, the interpretation of verse 9, where the confusion was being linked up in the law, was actually incorrect by backtracking from verse 13 and working through the King of the North and all the pronouns. So even if you had, Johnny, you had the King James, no other translations, you could do that. Mm -hmm. I've not gone through the trouble of doing that because it would get a bit confusing. The easiest way to do it was just show you a little translation. Does everybody understand that? Because you can see from the manual it says that the King of the North shall return, and you can go back to verse 12 and 11 to see the, the interplay between the North uh, and the South. So when the King of the North shall return, after the death of Ptolemy IV, which was the person in um, chapter, in verses 11 and 12, he dies, and his heir, who is Ptolemy V, he becomes heir at the age of five. So he's five years old, so he's a child king. And because he's a child king, and also because of the... Um, And because of the, um, the trouble that his father had in his kingdom, um, both killing the Jews and because of his luxurious lifestyle, there was rioting and anarchy in, his, in, in Egypt because nobody was happy with him. So the whole country is in a state of disunity. And now they've got a child king. And so the king of the north sees this as the right opportunity to regain territory and perhaps do away with um, the king of the south. So does that make sense of what the history is going on here? Okay. Egypt is coming to its decline because of the work of Ptolemy IV in verses 11 and 12. He wins this great battle, then he has a definite luxurious lifestyle. The people are not happy with it because he's taxing the people. He then destroys many of the Jews. And the Jewish people in, in Egypt at that time, they were like the, the learning people or the middle class, you could say, and they were kind of like the people who would run the government. So when you, when you kill so many of them, the actual governmental structure begins to break down. Yeah? So you can see that there's turmoil going on in Egypt, and when he dies, the sun comes on the sea, the kingdom's in uh, disarray, so the king of the north looks and says, oh, this is a good time, let's go and attack um, the king of the south. So it says, for the king of the north, shall return and shall set forth the multitude greater than the former. So he's going to get an even bigger army to come to the king of the south. And shall certainly come after certain years. Okay? When he first came, he came in 217 BC, if we remember. That was from verse 12. He came in 217 BC. And he failed. But now he comes in 202 BC. So about 15 years later, Okay, it says he should come after certain years, about 15 years later, with a great army and with much riches. So he's coming with power now to come and destroy the king of the south. So is everybody where I'm up to now? It all makes sense. Okay, so now, for those who kind of might look at this, where we get to start into the interesting bits, if you found all that boring. <laughs> Are we supposed to know this history very kind of intricately? Because I, I know it's a, as Sister White says, 30 to 36 gets repeated again in 40 to 45. And um, are they going to be, when we go into 40 to 45, are there going to be kind of comparisons or parallels on, on, on the same thing happening? I think I've tried to address that question before. My direct answer to that is no, I'm not going to particularly draw parallels from this, but it's showing us, if you, if you, today, because we're so focused, and I'll use the term Daniel 40 45, we lose, I think, the solemnity of these verses. But if you go back in history, there are many atheists, many agnostics who have converted to Christianity from these very verses when they saw history being fulfilled in the, in the verses that we've discussed. So, 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 so,
I, I, this is through this is through centuries. Yeah, many of them have. Many intellectual scholars uh, have, have looked at this. They've been challenged with these, with the, with the miracle of being able to predict all these things. People have studied and checked things out. And many people have been converted into Christianity because of the truthfulness of these words. Um, and I think, which is what I tried to say right at the beginning, even though most people on this message don't bother focusing on this, and they focus on 11 to 45, I'm not saying that people are wrong to do that, but I think it's a useful exercise to spend the time to look at history, to make sure that what we actually claim that we believe is actually true. And the, the process of doing that intellectually gives you a settling into the truth. And it gives you an experience in your, in your heart, because there's everything in the heart and the mind, where you can begin to really have confidence in the Word of God. The same happens in the trumpets as well. We yes. Focus on the three words when we want to leave out the first. Four, four. I, I, I totally agree, yeah. Um, it's also because every scripture is given by the inspiration of God. So, a little portion of scripture should be put aside because uh, we have been said by even Ellen White that certain portions are specifically applying to today. Uh, she also says that no word from the Bible is to fall to the ground un, uh, wasted. I mean, if God has given us all those details, all of them should be studied. We should know every detail of every book in the Bible. I was speaking to somebody over lunch, and I, I'm not saying everybody needs to know the same information to the same degree. Everybody in God's church is different, we all have different talents. So everybody must come to an experience with God through His Word to the level that they're at. So if you've got one talent, I guess you'd have one talent of information, or one talent of depth. But there are people have different talents, so everybody has to approach the scriptures as they, I was going to say as they see fit, but as God directs them to the depth that he says that they need to go. Some people go to great depths. Some people will, the meeting that we've had now and the information I've given, although it's taken a few hours, um, it took me weeks to, to collect this information and to check it and confirm it. And I've only, and this verses that I can really can still study properly, but you've got it in a few hours, this might, for some of you, it might be enough. You, you've got a good understanding of where those verses are, why they're given, and that might be enough information for some people. For others, they might want to dig deeper. So, everybody needs to take it where, where, where they are, and also where a person's interest is. So, we're into verse 14 now. Verse 14 onwards starts to get interesting. So, we're in verse 14. We've just said that the king of the north wants to come down into the king of the south, and the reason he wants to come down is because Egypt is in disarray, and the king of Egypt is now a child, and um, if he's a child, he's under governors, and there's governors who are contending to uh, try and overtake the government, so everything's collapsing around them. So, we're in, two, in verse 14, we're in the years 202, to 195, the same years as verse 13, we're in the same Syrian war, the fifth Syrian war, that's all the same. The sixth and the fifth king, were the king of the north and the king of the south, that's all the same. And now we get a new person on the stage. Okay? So the title of this portion of, the, uh, of this verse is that Rome attacks Greece and what I mean by Greece is Macedonia Macedonia to defend Egypt and this occurs in 201 BC okay, just after the start of the war sorry? M-A-C-E-D-O-N-I-A um, I actually don't really spell that the point yet, and I can spell it for the rest of it. M-A-C-E-D-O-N-I-A, I think. Macedonia. 
Okay. So, 